First, let me uh, thank uh, the sponsors for inviting me. Uh, I was telling Bob Galloway uh, first uh, that I think one of the very, very first meetings I ever went to was a spy meeting years and years ago where I heard Bob talking about this surgical navigation thing that he was trying to do at the time. And um, I was at IBM at the time. <clears throat> and what I'd really like to do, well, first, acknowledgments. Uh, I try to put uh, individual acknowledgments on slides, but uh, I'm going to be talking about the work of very, very many people, uh, which has been sponsored by very, very many uh, collaborators and funding agencies. And first off, I should really thank all of them uh, for helping make this possible. Um, <clears throat> this is, um, I think, the motivation that uh, over 20 years ago, I think it's about 23 years ago, motivated me uh, to get into this field. I was working on systems like this. This is a micron precision robot that had a work area about the size of this desktop uh, that we used in, in manufacturing test operations at IBM. And uh, this is Robodoc, which was the uh, first, uh, I think, system to do a significant surgery. And uh, they look rather different uh, to, if you just look at them, but underneath, they're actually quite common. They both couple information to action in the physical world to improve a process. And I think that is the underlying theme that I want to, to emphasize uh, in this talk. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture. I put a picture similar this, to this together uh, in the late 80s uh, to try to explain to my bosses at IBM why an information company should care about something like a medical robot. And uh, the idea, I think, is probably familiar to everyone here. You start with everything you know about the patient. An awful lot of that is in the form of medical images. And by the way, everything you know about people in general, rules for planning and what you want to do, you mush all of that together and make some kind of a computer representation that we call a model that lets you do what else you wanted to do. Uh, then uh, what you do once you've made that representation, you can, you can do diagnosis, uh, you can formulate a treatment plan. Well, the next really crucial step is you want to take all of that information into the operating room or intervention suite. And if you can then uh, register, if you confuse uh, the virtual reality with the reality, uh, you should be able then to use a variety of appropriate technologies to help you do what you plan to do and verify that you did it. Well, I'm basically an engineer, and we were trained to think of control loops. So that is a control loop for the individual patient closed through information. Oh, uh, look up here. That picture is sort of the same. And what that really is intended to remind us of is that that same process really occurs at many, many different time scales from managing a complete patient uh, treatment cycle right down to second by second in the operating room. Um, well, <clears throat> when we were working in manufacturing, uh, there was something else. We had information-driven machines that were helping us, often in partnership with people, do our manufacturing process, and they helped us try to be uh, systematic. But we knew what we did, and we were generating all of this data. So we actually saved all of that data. And if you've saved all the data, you had a, a yield problem, say, on a chip line, you could go back and do data mining. I don't think the term was invented then, but that's what we were doing to help us formulate a hypothesis and improve our process. Well, if you have a flight data recorder in the operating room, you can know what you did, you can be consistent, and eventually you know the patient's outcome. So we ought to be able <clears throat> to relate all of those things to each other. And I, my basic hypothesis from the very beginning has been it's the synergy of these blue loops with the information control that you can put around the entire process that can really drive a revolution <laughs> in interventional medicine. And uh, that's the, oh, this is actually a very, very old idea. Uh, it's as old as medicine. But again, uh, computers uh, can help us do that process better. 
And so that was the motivation. Um, shortly after I joined IBM, or uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, with some colleagues, uh, I wrote, spent a year and a half of hell, wrote the largest research proposal I've ever written, and we got it funded. Uh, we, so we got about 30, over the years, $33 million of seed money from the National Science Foundation uh, to build an engineering research center uh, around these concepts and our strategy. Well, we spent quite a lot of money uh, while we were spending out that seed money and had very generous support from actually some of the same sponsors that you're seeing here uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> Well, what did we get? Well, one of the things the NSF wants us to do is do basic research, but in these engineering centers, you want them driven by real problems and look at the synergies between these layers. So these are the pictures from our first site visit. It looks kind of sparse. This is the last time I bothered to make this slide, and I, I'm already out of room. And don't worry, we can't quite cover all of that in an hour. Uh, what I would like to do, however, <clears throat> is use this picture and examples uh, from our center, primarily from the Johns Hopkins part of our center, which also involves a number of other collaborators uh, and other academic institutions, to talk about these individual pieces and also give you some sense as to how they fit together. And uh, the first is, of course, patient-specific modeling, where you're trying to get a uh, data structures that represent the patient in a way that's efficient enough that you can do your intervention. And uh, again, uh, this is an area we've already this morning heard many examples of modeling. In fact, at SPY, I feel silly to try to give a tutorial on this. I might just mention uh, this is some work uh, that one of my graduate students, Blake Lucas, uh, has just been doing that, that I, I think is showing the kind of thing that we can do now, and I should thank Terry Peters uh, for the data that we used in this case. Um, <clears throat> I just want to highlight one theme, again, that is ubiquitous in the field, uh, and just a couple of examples, and that is uh, taking what you already know with some new information that you've, you're, you, that you've now gotten, mushing that together get you a better representation of this individual patient, which you can come back and do statistics with, or other things, depending on the application. So we often think of that in terms of radiological images, but I think it's important to realize that you could also deal with video. Uh, this is some work oh, from oh, about three, four years ago, where uh, what we have here is a kidney tumor with laparoscopic video from a da Vinci uh, video camera, and we fused uh, the video by basically modeling the surface and doing a registration with uh, the tumor, and now you can provide, that's the cut here line, uh, and you could see earlier things like the filling system for the kidney. Um, I should just say that uh, here's, here's a very much more recent example, and okay, this is playing. Uh, this is uh, some work uh, from Jeff Sewardson's uh, group at, uh, at Hopkins, uh, where, uh, and Dan Moroda and Greg Hager, where they're doing something very similar uh, for skull-based surgery. Here you have CBCT image uh, fused uh, with uh, laparoscopic or endoscopic video uh, for structures in the skull base. And um, I believe there may be another talk or two on that, so I won't steal their thunder. Uh, another area, uh, actually, we started working, oh, around 2000, uh, where if you take statistical models of a patient and a sparse set of projection images, you can make a much better representation of the patient, and uh, you, can, you can infer a model. And again, this whole theme is absolutely ubiquitous. You go here, you go to Mikai, you'll see very many papers in this area again. But I think I'm just using these as examples to illustrate uh, the kind of thing. Here's one application, actually from SPY, uh, where here the goal is uh, you're trying to plan uh, periacetabular osteotomies uh, for young women with hip dysplasia, where the interest is they want to get a very good CT model just of the acetabulum 
and then get enough additional information without putting a lot of radiation into the pelvis of this young woman uh, to, to plan and then do the registration for carrying out the intervention. And so again, uh, by, by combining statistics and a partial CT scan and a small number of x-ray images, you can get a model that is good enough to do those things. Um, hybrid reconstruction, we heard an example uh, this morning, in fact, uh, uh, I think uh, Jung Hoon's uh, slide is better than mine, so I'm going to skip. But again, the idea is you take either statistical information or prior CT, a very small, a sparse set of, of cone beam uh, projections, and you use the registered model to fill in the information uh, that you're missing. Um, well, that was the blazing run through just a couple examples of the kind of thing that really is the focus of this, this tremendous conference. Uh, I might just mention it's only part, though, of the total story. We've got to think about procedure planning. We need to be able to use the information to plan our intervention. And you have to worry about things like accuracy, the kind of things that Mike Fitzpatrick talks about and a number of the rest of us. And this is really very highly uh, specific uh, to the individual procedure. For historical note, uh, nostalgia, this is one of the planning screens from RoboDoc, which was that first uh, application that I got involved with. Uh, and uh, again, uh, there's, there's a lot of different outputs. Some of the emerging themes are, again, using statistical information, uh, especially if you can summarize outcomes to help us uh, improve the planning uh, and use statistical methods to help us do our planning. Dynamic online replanning in the operating room, which is the focus of, of this osteotomy work, uh, are examples. Uh, okay, uh, now the fun part. I kind of got asked to be a robot guy, and so I'm going to talk about this for a while. Um, I, at the rate I'm going, I may have some extra time to fill in some slides that I've missed. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the procedure execution, there are a lot of different ways that you can think about executing uh, these procedures. Um, I think the first thing for the robot people is to be a little bit humble. You don't always need a robot to provide the useful information. One obvious example are classical surgical navigation systems uh, here is another example uh, that we started work on a melon uh, with UC Gabor Fischinger in this. The Vegetable Care and Use Committee gave us really quick approval, <laughs> or at least no objections. But the idea is very simple. Uh, if you have a semi-transparent mirror and a display, you can line things up so that the virtual image uh, 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 you see, and the mirror is, uh, lines up with the corresponding physical slice through the patient. And then you can just use hand-eye coordination uh, to, to do the uh, in, in injections. This is, I, I hope, finally getting very close to a clinical trial. This is a recent cadaver study in our, in our lab. Uh, and there have been, just over the years, an enormous number of people and more papers than I could put on the slide. But I, I think this is a good, humbling experience for robotics people. Uh, well, robots can be useful. They're, they can be more precise, more accurate, sometimes more consistent. And they can go places that it's hard for a human to go. Uh, this was a very early example uh, uh, where what we have here is the needle driver has a fiducial structure on it so that from one image, by looking at the pattern in the fiducial structure, you can know where the needle is relative to the scan plane. So here, what we're doing is we're um, sampling a, uh, a tumor biopsy. Uh, and the, here, the, the biopsy is being done in plane, but even if you're out of plane, you know where the needle is driver is. And so this is one of the, um, one of the major themes, I think, for, especially for a meeting like this, is if you can close the, image in the loop through the image, it's going to be a lot more accurate 
and uh, then then if you're if you're trying to rely on some enormous calibration chain, and of course this is a repeated theme uh, in much of our uh, research in this field. Um, here's another example uh, of a needle placement robot. This is some early work. Uh, most recently being led at our place by uh, Peter Kazanzidis in a partnership with uh, Cliff Burdett, where what we have is a, uh, a system for replacing the uh, template in uh, uh, prostate brachytherapy with a very, very simple needle positioning system uh, for that, that will allow you to do uh, prostate biopsies or brachytherapy uh, off axis and in between, and also uh, is that less, less error prone in many ways uh, uh, and can speed up the workflow. The whole system is integrated back to the planning system. And again, uh, you see a number of other really excellent examples of this um, in the field. Uh, I saw some superb work uh, last two weeks ago at University of Western Ontario, uh, uh, UBC, a number of places are, are, are doing this now. Uh, that's an ultrasound guidance. Um, what about um, MRI? Uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, placing needles accurately in MRI guidance. Uh, this is some work uh, uh, I've, Greg Fisher was involved in an early stage in developing uh, this sort of a robot. Uh, where you're, you're, again, it's transperennial uh, needle placement uh, within uh, the bore of an MRI scanner. And the robot really has to be very different because it's MRI and you worry about plastic and artifacts. But the key thing I want to emphasize is actually not so much that as the fact that the robot is in an environment it's hard to get a human in and you're closing the loop and most of the rest of the process is really the same integrating with a planning system, integrating back with, uh, with uh, uh, the entire information system of the, uh, of the application. Uh, here's one other example. Uh, uh, this, again, I seem to be using a lot of Gabor Fischinger's uh, work here as examples because he spent uh, quite a while at, at Hopkins. But uh, this is a transrectal... Uh, system for transrectal access to the prostate uh, in an MRI system. It's a very, very simple system. It initially is manually actuated under image uh, feedback. And I still think the really cool thing is it went from literally the back of a, I think it was a placemat, uh, Gabor can, can tell me, to clinical use in two years. And uh, I, that to me is, is astonishing. Uh, here were some of the images uh, that they had for doing it. So here are the targets. Here are, after the needle was placed, here are the voids uh, for the needles. And then if you put a marker, uh, you get quite, quite good accuracy. The, the, the system was, in fact, licensed to industry. And here is the version. I think it's still pending... Uh, 510K clearance. Uh, I should just mention as well that uh, Lewis Whitcomb uh, has been very, very heavily involved with this entire uh, system. And uh, more recently, uh, for reasons of automation, they're going back and now beginning to motorize uh, this, uh, uh, this system for aiming, aiming needles. Well, all of these systems, we talk about needle placement, but they don't. They aim the needle at the target. And we assume that the needle goes straight. Guess what? It doesn't. Uh, for a lot of reasons, skinny needles tend to deflect. And one is just the bevel of the needle. I think this is also uh, from uh, Bob Webb, part of Bob Webster's thesis. Uh, um, and if, if you advance the needle as you bend it, uh, uh, it'll, you can steer it like a bicycle. Uh, Alison Akamura has led the research in this, and I apologize, Bob, your name should be on that as well. Uh, work is uh, proceeding uh, uh, on this, and here they're just now just to the point, finally, of just eminently going to begin to do in vivo work, but here is some of the more recent work uh, on needle steering at, at Hopkins. Um, 
there's been a long uh, tradition in uh, medical uh, robotics of trying to provide high dexterity in very confined spaces uh, on a small scale inside, inside a, a patient. Um, in fact, you can think of the da Vinci robot, although uh, as an example of that, you're trying to get little hands and wrists inside the patient. And those tools are five millimeters and larger, and they come in from angles. There's a lot of interest in coming in parallel, but also providing very high dexterity in small work volumes uh, uh, and smaller and smaller scale. Uh, the problem from a mechanical engineering perspective is as you uh, do that, um, it, uh, what you see is that it becomes more and more uh, difficult uh, uh, to build something with all those little bearings and pulleys and pivots and all that complexity and preserve strength and stiffness. So uh, there's been uh, quite a bit of interest in systems uh, that look at bending metal. And uh, here I just realized I had a hidden slide. Uh, this is an example um, of using what our... Um, at Hopkins, we called active cannulas. I believe the other term I often see are people talking about concentric tube robots. And again, Bob, uh, I think this is one of his slides. Um, there's, uh, there are groups elsewhere as well. The idea is if you have rotating or counter-rotating uh, curved flexible elements, by changing their relative position, you can change their shape. Uh, in this case, what we have is, are those going to actually play? I probably. Um, what you have is flexible elements that, that double as the structural elements and the actuation elements by pushing and pulling and bending. So this here has four millimeter diameter uh, and has actually uh, four degrees of freedom plus a gripper uh, in that um, uh, work volume. Uh, this is basically uh, uh, comparable uh, to, uh, it's actually higher dexterity than the Da Vinci in a uh, smaller, smaller space. Uh, and um, uh, it was work that was started by me and Nabil Saman when he was a postdoc at Hopkins, uh, continuing when he went to Columbia, and most recently uh, is now at Vanderbilt. And this is uh, the latest uh, instantiation of this system, uh, where the goal is it's a single port access uh, uh, surgical robot, again, using this high dexterity from bending elements in a uh, very small space. Um, um, here's another uh, robot uh, that we've developed at Hopkins, again, for providing high dexterity and also high stiffness in a very small uh, confined space. It's a flexible nitinol uh, tube uh, that we've developed with the Applied Physics Lab where uh, the idea is you can pass various tools through this high stiffness, steerable lumen, under image guidance. And here, uh, the motivating application was to provide a way of doing minimal access uh, resection of osteolytic lesions, either from metastatic cancer or, uh, in this case, from what's called particle disease, osteolysis from wear particles that can uh, cause bone behind an orthopedic implant to deteriorate. Uh, you don't want to, in doing a revision, you're going to replace the, the, the lining of the cup. But if this isn't already loose, you don't want to knock it loose because you can cause enormous damage uh, if it's still fixed to the bone. So the idea is to get in there or through here or through here to clean out uh, the cavity. Uh, but once you've developed a robot that can do that kind of thing, there are other things that you can think about doing with it. Um, Here's another example, and just a short advertisement. On Tuesday, there's a great talk from my student, Paul Fianfrappa. 
And here, the goal is to try to retrieve a particle that is bouncing around, for instance, from uh, shrapnel uh, or inside the heart. Uh, the obvious thing to think about is, gee, I'll get a really fast robot, and I'll chase down that particle. Well, those particles bounce around really fast, and it's quite some impressive robot if you can do it. And I don't know if I want it, that robot that's fast. So our idea, and you can see it over here, is basically to make the robot pretend to be a bass or a pike. It'll figure out where the particle is likely to be from the ultrasound images, and then come over, position itself where it's going to be, wait for it to get there again, and snarf it. And if you want to see more about uh, aspects of this, come to the talk on Tuesday. Uh, here's one final example of uh, high dexterity. This is an extremely simple robot. Uh, this is basically, uh, you can think of it as a, an ESOP, uh, endoscopic uh, robot, for, uh, for use in the throat, for, for manipulating flexible laryngoscopes. Uh, uh, we built it uh, specifically targeting uh, IRB approval. We're just going through the, the IRB uh, uh, process right now with it. But uh, the surgeon, Dr. Richman, uh, said, gee, he wanted something he could use right away. And so this is an extremely simple, very, very robust system for basically allowing him to manipulate his endoscopic view for, minim, uh, for, for transoral uh, surgery in the throat below the vocal cords. Uh, aside from its educational value and clinical usefulness, one of our parts of our research strategy is now we have a way of getting those images, and some of the next steps would be to do the same kind of image fusion that you saw for that skull-based robot or, or the uh, da Vinci robot, use some of that technology to help us fuse to preoperative CT or MRI images. Well, this is, of course, the da Vinci robot. Uh, this is the one that's in our lab. This is the do da Vinci is clearly the dominant medical robot paradigm in terms of market penetration today. And it's a complete teleoperator. The robot does what the surgeon's hands do while the surgeon watches in stereo TV. Uh, this is using a 21st century machine to do 19th century surgery in a 20th century MIS uh, paradigm. But the crucial thing actually is that we have placed a computer between the surgeon and the patient. And a major theme in our research is finding ways that we can exploit uh, the capabilities of that computer uh, uh, to enhance value, to add things like safety barriers, trading off control, improving uh, the display, such as you've already seen some examples of the display. Uh, here is some work uh, from Nicholas Padoy, who's a, a research faculty at Hopkins, and Greg Hager, where what they've done is they've located in image processing that uh, thread, and the robot now knows when it's held up like that to go cut it. And uh, here's a similar uh, example uh, where we're saying, hey, uh, go grasp that. And so these are the kind of things that you can begin to do. All of this is far, of course, from clinical deployment today. Um, uh, here's another example. Uh, this is some work, actually, we started about, about 2004 or 5, uh, where the goal is to add to the imaging capabilities and integrate them with, uh, uh, with in this case, the da Vinci robot. And uh, we've done a number of things with it to provide augmented displays, uh, additional information, allow the surgeon to manipulate uh, in a minimally invasive environment, an ultrasound probe in much the same way he or she would uh, in, in open surgery. Um, well, there are other things, of course, you can do intraoperatively with ultrasound other than just get pictures. One is if you use elastigraphy, and uh, again, this was all reported in spy meetings, by tracking the speckle as you push on the tissue, you can, you can figure out the stiffness of the tissue and then this will give you improved registration uh, to, uh, 
preoperative images. So now we have a fused model. If what we do is now we can put something like a little electromagnetic marker into, uh, say, a tumor in the kidney and provide the same sort of video overlay track to the tumor that I showed you earlier. Uh, and this, was, this particular case was targeting freehand, but we're obviously interested in integrating it with the robot. And so here is a, uh, an assistive behavior uh, in which the robot is just, as you drive the, t the, the probe across, in this case this phantom, but across the organ, uh, the robot follows the surgeon but adds a little palpating motion at the same time, and then this is all integrated back to give us the elastography to help us find the lesion. Um, I, let me give one sort of systems example here. Uh, uh, retinal microsurgery. This is one of the larger research projects that I personally am involved with uh, right now. Uh, retinal surgery is technically probably it arguably the most difficult uh, surgery. Uh, you're working with, uh, through a microscope with bad ergonomics, trying to peel membranes uh, of 20 microns thick or smaller, some are as thin as three microns off the surface of the retina, or manipulate vessels and features about the size of the hair on your head. You're using instruments uh, like this that are less than a millimeter in diameter and by the way, your hand shakes. So it's extremely uh, challenging uh, procedure. So the goal of, of this research project is to try to develop technology that will help uh, transcend human limit, these human limitations, integrate and then integrate them into a complete system and see and then evaluate it. Uh, and let me just give a few examples. Uh, this, it's a system. I want to, this is the block diagram of the entire systems approach. And again, the key thing is really the workstation. And a bunch of these capabilities, you can think of them as peripherals or plugins. And the system architecture is the real enabler. Uh, this is what the system looks like in our lab. Uh, this is a recent photograph of most of the components of the system in our lab. And this is in, um, we have another lab down at, uh, at the hospital, uh, which is an old operating room that we have for use as a lab. And uh, so this is a bunny vitrectomy that we were doing um, about, oh gee, this was a couple months ago. Uh, the um, one thing that probably I should mention is rabbits are actually harder to operate on than people. Their eyes are tiny and the anatomy is a little different. Well, what can you do with this? Uh, in this case, one of the things we can do is we can, here, let me just run that again. We can uh, take what is often a very limited field of view and build up a mosaic. That's a very simple, obvious thing to do. Um, another thing you can do, you can also, part of that is you're tracking the retina. Now, if you have annotations, if you know something about some piece of the retina, you can continue to track and display that information in a superimposed way. Here is a phantom showing some of that. This is a uh, vitrectomy. Uh, again, this is a bunny vitrectomy from, uh, oh gee, a couple months, maybe, maybe a month ago, uh, that, that shows, the, shows some of that capability. Uh, so here what we're able to do is keep track of the retina and as it, as it moves, the eye moves an awful lot in eye surgery, uh, interestingly. Uh, keep track of all of that uh, to fuse information. Well, you have tools. So you need to know where the tools are. Uh, and in this case here, so we've invested quite a lot of research in various uh, ways to track uh, retinal tools. Uh, this is an enormously uh, challenging problem. Uh, I'm not sure we, we're quite there uh, where we want to be. Uh, here's another example where uh, if you, where one of the things is if you insert a tool, you'd like to automatically note, notice it and, go, and, and locate it and start tracking it. Well, gee, knowing where the tool is is nice, knowing where the retina is is nice. What you really want to know is the relation of the tool to the retina. 
And so, uh, in fact, one of the things we do is we track one relative to the other. And here, what we're doing is we're generating a warning when the tool is getting close to the retina. An experienced surgeon may not want that, but by golly, if there's a resonant and the attending watching it, the resonant wants that information. Uh, and uh, here, the, we also have a force sensor so we can sense contact, and, and what you're seeing here is when the uh, disparity of the tool and the disparity of the retina cross, this is where you're seeing contact forces. Uh, no, how do I get this to go on? Uh, okay, well, I mentioned hand tremor. Let's go to the robot for a moment. There are a couple ways you can deal with hand tremor. Uh, one is uh, with a freehand device. This is a uh, this component of our research is led by Cam Revere at Carnegie Mellon, where uh, basically it's like noise-canceling headphones. Uh, the robot senses hand tremor, hand motion, and has a very fast robot to move to counteract it. Uh, this is an enorm To make this work practically and robustly in surgery is enormously challenging, and we're still working on it, but is a very encouraging approach. The other uh, is what we call our steady hand robot. And why isn't my video playing? Uh, in this case, uh, we have a, a robot. I think this is about, well, to be honest, it's probably closer to about five micron precision, uh, where you have a force sensor. And so the robot and the surgeon both hold the tool. And the robot feels the surgeon pulling on the tool and moves to comply. And if you do that, uh, the robot uh, is, also has one of these isocentric mechanisms. So the pivot point is about where you go into the sclera. And uh, the nice thing about it is, because it's a robot doing the motion, it has no hand tremor. Also, uh, because it's a robot doing the motion, uh, you, can, you, you can do things like you can enforce safety barriers or add additional uh, sensory information to the feedback loop. And uh, here, one of, the one of the applications is trying to inject drugs into a 100 micron blood vessel that might have, a, 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 say, a clot in it. So you're trying to inject something to dissolve the clot. Uh, and uh, this is, the, it's hard to get it in. But once you have it in, uh, you've also got to, uh, to hold it there for five minutes while you do the injection. Now, this is actually a live video. If you had been watching carefully, you would have seen bubbles go through there occasionally. Um, here, this just shows a, a more recent experiment. These are all on chicken embryos in our lab. And uh, this is just showing one of the more recent experiments. Uh, we're just now doing a comparative study of human versus uh, robot uh, for, for doing, doing these sort of uh, procedures. And maybe by next year, I'll be able to report something. I mentioned force. The forces between the tool and the retina in retinal surgery in order of magnitude or more below what any human can feel. Uh, further, uh, the force between the tool and the sclera, where it goes through the eye, is an order of magnitude greater than the force between the tooltip and the retina. So what we have to do is, on these submillimetric tools, we have to put force sensors inside the eye. And so what we've done is we've built uh, these force sensors into the, uh, uh, using uh, Bragg grading uh, optical fiber force sensors, into the shaft of these instruments. Uh, so here's one example. Then how do you feed that information back? You could do it through, haptically through the robot. Another thing, though, you can do, the surgeon doesn't like you messing with his hand. And if he's freehand, you can't do it anyhow. So what we've mostly been using is auditory substitution. So you, the tune, the frequency and tone three, changes four, as you get closer. Three, three, four, three, four, you can also three, two, use voice three, to four. tell the surgeon how hard things ouch, are. Ouch, ouch. <laughs> and it, you, you also ouch, can ouch, keep ouch, graduate ouch, students ouch. motivated late at night. Ouch, ouch. Uh, the, 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 all the eye surgeons really love that for some reason. Um, 
Here is uh, actually, this should say 2012. Uh, this is a tool that, um, again, this is a, uh, um, a talk. Here is a, a more recent example of a tool. In this case, it, it incorporates a, uh, uh, a, a tweezers. And so this is the kind of thing that we're doing. And again, these are just video uh, and, and slides that you'll, you'll get to see uh, at, at the talk. One thing I might just mention that really is important to us is um, that, uh, again, we have a complete system. And so one of the side effects of the complete system is we're able to capture every, every signal, all the video, in a time-stamped way uh, during the procedure. And we can use that to develop our tools down the line, what we've done is we've made a flight data recorder for the operating room. And I really believe that this gets into that red loop that I was talking about earlier. Uh, now, if this will cooperate with me. Uh, uh, other things, of course, you can do. If you have force feedback, you can uh, um, uh, you use the information uh, for feedback to the robot in various ways. This is actually, it was accepted and published in BioRob, uh, uh, one example of using the robot in, in a very natural way uh, to help it just sort of naturally follow compliant directions and uh, generates very natural virtual fixtures for things like membrane peeling. Uh, imaging. Uh, it, you don't really know what goes beyond the, uh, the tip of the tool. Even with a microscope, it's really hard to tell. Uh, one of the things that we've also looked at doing is integrating, uh, in this case, optical coherence tomography, uh, Fourier path, common, uh, common path, OCT, into, the, uh, into one of these submillimetric uh, surgical tools. So you get A scans at I think the, the rate is now something phenomenal, like close to several hundred thousand A scans a second. Uh, so you get images, and if you scan the tool, you can build up a B, a B mode or C mode image. Uh, you can also, you have the tissue spectrum. So here, this is where we think uh, oxygenated blood is, just from looking at the tissue spectrum. Uh, so here are just some more examples of that. Uh, Okay, so here what we're doing is we're adding a distance feedback to maintain a constant distance uh, from the retina. This was uh, a couple of years ago. That, uh, that really should be 2010 not two, or 29, not 2001, but it's a typo in the slide. So again, we're trying to put all of this information together. And, uh, here would be a typical uh, sort of display where we have forces, uh, which we are also making auditory signals, OCT uh, scan history. As you scan, you get sort of a moving time squares display. Uh, here's another example, uh, something we call an M scan. And now, the idea here is that what I'll do is I take my microsurgical tool with the OCT, I scan it across the retina and note where the OCT was aiming. And then that will produce a, sort of a strip map of a cross section across here. Now what the surgeon is looking for is he's looking for a, a defect, a place where he can grab the edge of a membrane to start peeling. Uh, this is like peeling sticky tape off a of tissue paper without tearing the tissue paper. So, uh, and then as you, once you've done that, if you come back and you point uh, at the M scan, it'll give you, it'll show you where you are and give you uh, kind of a, a close up view. Here is uh, a, an example uh, uh, done on a phantom uh, of, of that idea. So here we're building up, uh, and so here you can kind of see. Uh, uh, well, what that looks like. Um, I'm going to have to go a little faster to make up for my crash. Uh, if we look at, if we go now to evaluation and feedback, uh, there have actually been a number of examples already presented. Um, mention just a few. Elastigraphy, again, uh, 
there have been a number of papers uh, by Imad Bakhtar and others here, uh, is one place where you can, in this case, uh, use it to uh, monitor or assess uh, uh, phase changes or stiffness changes in tissue during RF ablation. Uh, you can, uh, again, there are spy papers here uh, fusing ultrasound and x-ray uh, to help us uh, locate where uh, seed patterns are in the, uh, in the prostate. Uh, another example, uh, there's another project that we have where what we're trying to do is to inject cement, in this case, into the proximal femur to strengthen uh, the bone of a patient who is at risk of osteoporotic bone fracture. And uh, so if we do the injection, uh, uh, what we need to do is we need to know what the shape of the cement is. Now, you could do interactive, intraoperative cone beam CT, but that's a lot of radiation. So here the goal is from a very small number of images. Uh, in fact, in this case, four x-ray projections uh, by doing a deform what, what amounts to uh, a, a deformable level set uh, with some prior knowledge, you can get really very good reconstructions of the cement. Uh, if, if that's been patient loop, let's just talk very briefly about the process loop, and I'd better hurry because I've got 10 minutes and leave a couple for questions at least. Uh, here again, these systems generate enormous amounts of data. We are to the point where we can make the entire intervention suite its own flight data recorder. We would like to take all of that information, planning data, outcome data, and begin to fuse it to uh, help us plan better and execute better and make better decisions. Uh, let me skip that. Uh, let me just give maybe one or two examples. Uh, one of the areas that we've been looking at has been in the area of radiation therapy planning. Uh, uh, IMRT planning is an enormously difficult uh, task. Uh, and the idea is, can we use the database of previously treated patients uh, and their plans to help us uh, uh, speed up and improve the quality of IMRT planning? Part of the trouble is it's such a hard process that you typically solve a series of problems, and the dosimetrist never quite stops when he thinks it's about as good as he can do, but no one quite knows. So the idea is, can we go find similar structures, similar patients in our database, and in, for quality control, if there's someone who looks similar, who had a better plan in terms of sparing organs uh, from radiation, perhaps we should use that optimization problem applied to this patient's data or the other thing is, perhaps if we find a similar patient, we can start with that optimization problem and optimize from there. Uh, it turns out you can do both of those things, and it appears that in quality control, you can find a number of cases where, where you can improve the plan. The other thing, uh, we've been doing some studies where if, if you um, do this, uh, plans that we've generated practically automatically and then compare them blind to one done the traditional way, uh, e the, either the clinician says they're equivalent or generally actually prefers the automated plan. So this is very encouraging. There are a couple journal papers out and there'll be another one out soon, I hope. One other example, uh, this is some work uh, from Ben Kang, where the goal is to take post-operative unnormalized x-rays of ACL repairs and figure out on a statistical model variations in tunnel position and then perhaps we can compare those to the clinical record and see how does variation in ACL tunnel position affect, um, uh, affect uh, life of the implant to get a better guideline as to how accurate you have to place the tunnel uh, for ACL repair. Um, Coming back, look, the robot or the imaging is not going to be the robot. It's going to be the room. Similar, the imaging system is not going to be the imager, and it's going to be the room. I think we are heading toward an environment in which we have to have multiple components interacting with each other in a very information-intensive way. This is, I believe, the future 
of information-driven interventional medicine. Now, one element that's really important are we need, if we're going to do this in an efficient way, we need standard interfaces and modular components in our software. Uh, there are VTK, ITK are examples of this. Uh, one that we've pushed that kind of complements these packages is something we call the Surgical Assistant Workstation, which is an open source uh, environment that was used to generate, provided the infrastructure for the research examples I've uh, shown you here. And again, the idea is to have uh, modular interfaces with some core libraries that can operate uh, compatibly with vendor, we develop parts of it with Intuitive Surgical. So by a curious coincidence, it works really well with the DaVinci, but it'll also work with other surgical robots and, uh, and, and scanners and so forth. Here's just one final example. Um, this again is uh, the Trek system uh, that Ali Oneri uh, put together uh, in Jeff's lab. And again, uh, the key thing is modular interfaces and modular software. And if we ever want to share and work with each other and speed this field up, this is what we have to do. Well, um, I have more or less come to a, an end. These, I just gave a few examples of how all of these components um, fit together. Uh, I think this has been our working model, and I think it's a good one for this community. Use clinical applications to provide the focus and real problems. Now, at least for us, we have a number of driving areas. There can be others. Uh, and again, a variety of funding models. But in the end, here's, here's the real bottom line of it. I've used every talk for about 12 years. I finished with this slide. Computer-based systems can transform interventional medicine. Uh, we can provide new capabilities to transcend human limitations. These systems can improve consistency and quality, and again, through the feedback, we can, we can learn what we ought to try to be doing. In the end, we have to justify what we do in terms of either better outcomes or greater cost effectiveness, or both. If, remember the old Fram oil filter commercial about pay me now or pay me later. That is certainly true in medicine. And again, the final thing is it actually isn't all about us. It's really about the patient. We're all going to be someday needing care. It could be our mother or our sister. And I think the most rewarding thing that also helped motivate me to change my career was the thought that rather than just make somebody rich or get tenure or something, you could actually see technology directly affecting people. And I think among the people in this room, we have that. This is what we all, I think, motivate us to come to work in the morning. So I am done. I actually, despite the crash, have four minutes left. And I can take a couple questions until they throw me off the platform. <laughs>